on the couch, we couldn't be more excited to welcome Eisner award-winning writer and artist, Terry Moore. In addition to stints on several notable titles at Marvel and DC, Terry is known for his three self-published series, Strangers in Paradise, Echo, and the currently running Rachel Rising. We talked about Rachel Rising and gender roles back in episode eight, by the way. Today, we're gonna chat with Terry about making comics his way, what he'd take with him to a deserted island, and well, everything in between. Thank you for joining us, Terry. Glad to be here, thanks. Before we get kind of started into the, like the meteor stuff, can you talk to us about what you're working on right now, besides obviously Rachel Rising, other comics projects, TV projects, movies, space flight, things like that? Uh, the only other outside thing I have going on right now is that Alcon Entertainment is trying to develop a Rachel Rising television show. And I'm encouraging them to do that. They, <laughs> they, they acquired it last year and then made an announcement earlier this year that they were going forward to into development, which doesn't mean, you know, it's coming on air. It just means we're throwing money at it and time at it. So I mean, I, that's, that's exciting, though. That's I mean, so many comics properties these days get purchased, but nothing ever happens with them. You know, not, not even to the development stage. So, I mean, that's encouraging that they're they're moving forward. And, and that, yeah, and I've certainly had my share of experience with with that. <laughs> with the interesting options because uh, that's what happened to Echo. It, a guy got it and um, kept it for a couple of rounds of options, and uh, but now it's back in on my desk again. And you know, that's typically the norm that you know um, people acquire these things just to get them off the market, or they you know it's an impulse buy. It's almost like all these indie comics are sitting at a register somewhere in Hollywood, cash register, and they just pick them up like gum, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> then decide later if they want to mess with them. So, so is, is Rachel Rising at a different later point than Echo ever got to? Yes. No, oh, okay. I've never been this far with any project. Awesome. How involved are you in the conversation? In the conversation, I'm very important, but in the day, <laughs> <of> the day <laughs> I haven't done a thing. You know, they're working on a script. And I'm not involved in that. So I'm very anxious to see how this all pings back to me, um, how another uh, smart writer looks at it and uh, gathers it together for a television format. So, you know, there's, there's just something weird there. You know, you're just, it's kind of like sending your kid off to uh, camp. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very interested in what, they, what my kid looks like when I see them next time. Oh, a little scared though, too, right? I mean, that's oh, seems sure, so yeah, you know, it's it because it, I've seen fan fiction of my stuff before that, that there was a script written for Echo that was just awful. <laughs> and, um, so, yeah, it can go really wrong, but I think the thing that about the only control I ever have is being careful who I pick to turn loose with it. And I think I pick really good people to, you know, turn loose. And then once, once you've picked them, you've got to trust them and you got to let them go do their thing. You know, I, I, I for instance, if I were to get some big name guy to pick it up, uh, somebody that we all know, uh, I certainly wouldn't call them and tell them what to do, you know? So you get you got to feel that way about your producers and the people who pick you up, and uh, I, I'm feeling like I'm in good hands. That's awesome. That's very encouraging because I think we we've talked a lot, and I've certainly seen other people comment on how episodic Rachel Rising is. It lends mm. itself to our imagination working quite well in the television medium. So if you have faith in who you've passed it on to, then it's encouraging for the rest of us to have faith that it's gonna continue to develop in good hands. Well, that's good. I mean, if we all get a positive vibe, maybe it'll resonate in the universe and yeah. make, it, make it so. <laughs> maybe we can make a butterfly effect out of all this. That sounds like a good plan. So what is a typical writing day for you? Or what is a typical drawing day? Or I guess maybe more specifically, do you segregate your actual writing and, and drawing activities in that way? Not not too much. If I'm really stuck on plot, I will sit down and be a writer with my keyboard. But if I'm feeling good and I'm connected with the story, then I just sit down and cartoon, uh, meaning I write and draw at the same time. Oh, that's fascinating. 
Yeah, and, it, and cartooning is like being a singer-songwriter. You know, you pick up your instrument and it just all happens at the same time for you, the, the creative person, you know, versus, you know, sitting down with a keyboard and writing a story is kind of like sitting down and just writing a poem with, with your guitar nowhere in the room. So it's a different discipline. And um, But when I write, of course, I know where it's going. So I, I, I'm writing, if I write with a keyboard, then I'm thinking of, okay, how am I going to play this? How am I going to draw this? So I'm, I'm writing for my cartooning needs. But typically, I do, I'm just a cartoonist. I, I, I start at the top left of the page on a blank page, and I work my way down. And, th and that's all... That's all things you've learned from previous, prior to doing independent comics and doing your the comic strips. I'm assuming that was that was your work process. Yeah, I learned it in high school when we started drawing uh, um, one a, pay, a page of panels so we could tell a short sequence story. And to be honest, you know, I was 15 years old and we were drawing these little toad characters that were funny and the toads would get blown up or drive off a cliff in a Volkswagen Beetle or something, which we thought was funny. And I discovered that it was funnier if I set it up with a few panels. And then it was even funnier if I set it up with a two-page sequence, you know, where there was a page with maybe seven or eight panels on it and then a second page where it all happens. Mm -hmm. And I got bigger laughs. So by having that direct daily marketing, test marketing with my friends, I figured out sequencing how sequence how important sequencing was and and developing and having patience you know when you a lot of times with cartoon art what you really want to do is draw the payoff panel it was all about that one panel it was your idea and then you discover that you need 12 panels in front of that to really make it work and it's the discipline of learning how to do that and getting the set up just right it's a little bit like learning how to be a video editor but uh, it's all from the same planet, you know. Well, it seems like it's a big evolution of writing itself that to learn the anticipation, the build up to the payoff, it seems like it's something that takes a while for a lot of creators to, to learn. That you don't, exactly. the reveal, you know, the slow burn is, is often more rewarding than the instant gratification. If you think about, say, for instance, O. Henry stories or uh -huh. Edgar Allan Poe mm -hmm. stories. And uh, the whole point of the story was on the last two or three pages. Right. And every page ahead of that was just something you needed to know. And um, that's exactly how it is in the comics. So do you take notes about dialogue or or the the actual text as you are drawing? Do you refine that a little bit later? Yes, um, constantly editing. If I think of uh, clever little dialogue lines, which happened a lot when I'm working with people like Jet or Kachu, um, because they're quick-witted and you know mm -hmm. they have sharp tongues. So when I would think of something, I would jot it down, and, and a, a lot of times it did get used. So and, and then I'm always once I'm writing, um, I'm constantly changing. And even after I ink, and even after I Photoshop it, and even after I lay it out, I'll read it back again and. Um, if the if the dialogue doesn't flow well, I'll I'll change it, you know. And so it's you read it out loud to yourself. I yeah, I, I'll read out loud uh, yeah. sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. And when I'm reading this finished work back, I to me it's not really locked down yet. It's not locked down until I have to send it away. But I'm looking at the finished work like a director looks at a final play rehearsal. And if we can move somebody around and make it flow better, you know, if anything catches your I when it shouldn't or you know if there's a stumble in the flow of the dialogue that kind of thing you know mm -hmm. I, oh, I love that my background is in theater and I constantly talk about how the the storytelling process in comics and the storytelling process on the stage is very similar to me they feel they both feel very or organic in their discovery and so it's it's sort of wonderful to hear you make that analogy with the development of your your own work do you do you listen to music ever while you're working yes constantly my having this musical background music is really key to me it makes it it, it um I, I love having soundtracks to my life and mm -hmm. to the years and what's what stage i'm in I definitely have soundtracks for each of these uh, books you know i listen i listen to different music now than for this uh, Rachel than I did for Echo than I did for S SIP. Yeah, I, I, 
that makes sense because <laughs> thematically they're very different. <laughs> there were a lot of times in SIP where I was listening to like Enya or something. And then when I was working on Echo, I was listening to Metallica. And when I started Rachel Rising, I was listening to Marilyn Manson. <laughs> <laughs> that almost seems a little too on the head. <laughs> um, well, I, I have a question. So we've talked about sort of your work day, but um, what do you do when you're not working? Like, I know those days are probably few and far between, but how do you spend your off time? When I'm, my, the only off time I get is when I travel to a convention. Mm. Uh, when I'm home, there's always a book due. So I work seven days a week and, um, we kind of have a lifestyle that's just developed around me being the cartoonist, you know, um, I, I wake up, eat, uh, hit the studio and then break for meals. And I, and I work till about two in the morning or so. And then I get up the next day at about nine thirty and start over again. And that's kind of my routine. That's how I've managed to make all these books over the last, few, you know, 20 years. Wow. Um, so it's not really a job, it's a lifestyle. In order to keep from, you know, um, to keep up, I I go out a couple of times a day to go get my Coke and, I mean, my Coca-Cola. Right, I was going to say, <laughs> with, with that schedule, that could mean a couple of different things. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, you know, the cons are when I socialize and things like that, and then uh, Twitter and, and uh, I'm... I, stay really and try to stay in touch with everybody's blogs and YouTube feeds and everything like that. And so I'm, I'm really, I have a heavy media blitz on me every day. So. But that gives you a little bit of a breakup between the staring at the, at the page and, and drawing, like having at least the internet as a, as a way of getting the distractions throughout the, the day. Yeah. I'm kind of a loner, but I'm not living like a monk. I'm not, I'm not cut off from anything. I, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on everything. <laughs> So if you could, then, what would be your dream vacation? Wow. <laughs> or is that so far out of the realm of possibility? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can't even imagine that. Um, the um, My wife, Robin, and I have certainly had some wonderful times where we've been in some beautiful places and just enjoyed the day. So I certainly know how to appreciate that. I have a favorite hotel in Hawaii that uh, where a little band plays uh, at sunset. Hawaiian songs and a form of Miss Hawaii does the hula dance and they serve you these wonderful drinks and you can watch the sunset over the, um, the bay. It's so there's places like that, that, you know, I, I found a couple of Shangri a couple of Shangri La's on the planet that I like. Mm -hmm. So I'm always happy to get a chance to go back to those places. Excellent. Yeah. It's, there's just some pretty places and even in America, I've seen some gorgeous places in America. Well, like Hawaii in America, right? Yeah, <laughs> but you know, you'd be surprised. I, I have seen some gorgeous places like up in, uh, when you get out the countryside of Illinois and uh, Utah and places like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Pennsylvania yeah, can be gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Well, so you've given us a little bit of a sense of, of how you feel about solitude just with your, your work schedule. So if you were heading off to a deserted island, I, it can even be Hawaii, that's fine. But just by yourself, what are the three things that you would take with you? Think impractical. You don't have to waste your things on survival items. I will grant you this deserted island with modern conveniences. But I want to know what you would take to occupy your mind. Do I have any idea how long I'm going to be there? Uh, let's call it indefinitely, but you will get home eventually. Okay. Uh, well, I will take my... Um... I would like to have a Coke machine there, please. <laughs> <laughs> a constantly and, uh, refilling Coke machine? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And uh, my... I'm sensing that this is a very important part of your routine. If if I run out of uh, Diet Coke, I stop working. Oh. <laughs> and I will go get another one. <laughs> <laughs> and I have actually been so desperate for a Diet Coke when I was stuck at tables at cons that I would tweet, if somebody brings me a Diet Coke, I'll give you a sketch. <laughs> and I would get a Diet Coke within five minutes. And I was so grateful. That, that's, that's what the Internet's really for. Uh, it's not about problem solving for global issues. It's for, you know, bringing me drinks. Okay. Um, so anyway, I've got my Coke machine and I would have uh, uh, some, my drawing supplies and then my guitars. 
And then I would be happy. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that island and this studio. <laughs> <laughs> would you bring a book? Do you do you have time to read ever? I do have time to read, and I might have time on that island. But, you know, if I forgot to, if I don't have room for a book, I'll just make one to read. That's what I did with SIP. I was looking to read a book like that. I couldn't find it, so I drew it for myself. That's awesome. So Andrea and I both have kids, and we talk a lot about what they may or may not grow up to be. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Grew up. <laughs> grow up, grew up. <laughs> I wanted to be uh, a creative person who could, uh, you know, not have to work nine to five. Was that always the goal? The arts were always just in, in your blood? Yeah. I, I remember when being like less than 11 years old and playing a game where I was drawing pictures on a deadline and somebody was taking the pages from me and, you know, turning them in. And <laughs> God, it's so amazing how that worked out. I just never wanted to work nine to five. I knew I didn't fit in. Well, uh, what did your uh, what did your parents do? Well, uh, actually, they. My dad was a creative person. He was a director for film and television, hmm. and um, so he. That's what he was doing when I was growing up. My summer jobs were always working on uh, film crews, and. Um, commercials and things like that. So you were always kind of exposed to the creative process, especially the business side of it. Yeah, and especially the people, um, because that's a different kind of people. They're all kind of theater-oriented people. Yeah. A lot of big personalities and um, a lot of delicacy uh, of how you work with people, um, how far you can push or not push creative people, and how to get you know 30 people organized to make something gorgeous. So that was the kind of things I saw my dad do growing up. And he did, also did some theater. But. It's so interesting that you saw such a collaborative side of the creative process. And yet you do a lot of your work independently. So it's, it's mm -hmm. not collaborating with a writer or collaborating with an artist or obviously like on a much bigger scale, like film or, or television or theater. Well, uh, see, uh, if I have to be honest, I would say that, um, I, I love the outcome of a, of a of an ensemble effort, but my work and my creative ideas are actually coming from more of a, just a singular writer vision. You know, mm -hmm. I just uh, I always felt more like a, the person who would write the material as opposed to the person who would stand up and deliver it. So that's kind of a, a loner thing. You know, you my my heroes were individuals who who produce the the script or the play i i, I never not the wanted, actor necessarily yeah i've never Who's... wanted to be the actor because even when i was a kid i knew i didn't have that i wasn't that kind of person i wasn't the i didn't have the physical qualities or the charisma or the e the, the the personal you know confidence but i did have i knew that i did have um uh an ability to look and comprehend what i was looking at I could see what was going on in the room and and explain it later. So that 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 that's all you need to be to be the writer, really. Can can I ask just to go like kind of looking over? I was just kind of going through your your works again today, you know, refamiliarizing re myself. And what when you have done kind of the mainstream or other people's books, like say fables, you know, you you did an issue of fables. What was the decision to okay i'm and i'm i will draw this this one issue or i will take this project outside of my own work on fables it was um because i was asked by shelly bond and she's a good friend that i've known for years and i've always wished i could do something at vertigo with shelly on the book because she's such a champion of uh, creative people uh -huh. so shelly gently twisted my arm and i said yes immediately <laughs> And there's always the hope in the back of my mind that if I did some of these outside projects that more people would discover me and, and that I make books. Uh, because being indie, you know, it's uh, you're always playing to the indie club. And once in a while, if you can share the stage of these bigger acts, it, it helps. Right. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Well, let's talk a little bit about Rachel Rising for a minute. Can you... Talk us through the research that goes into writing a story that is so steeped in religious mythology. Well, I have to tell you, I'm doing no research. Oh, um, that's awesome. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. I just have a head full of it after having lived my whole life um, reading a lot. 
Okay. Uh, so it's just stuff coming out of my head uh, from a mix master in my head of, you know, I've read a lot of books cover to cover from all the angles and everything. And I just, it's, it's all one big, uh, it's all one big stew to me. And then it comes out like this. And I'm fascinated by not so much the details of each camp and each side of these big, uh, you know, life issues. I'm more fascinated by the, the movement uh, through society over the centuries, how it alters and shifts. Mm-hmm. Um, what's acceptable, right? What's acceptable 100 years ago is uh, totally unacceptable now, although the, the fact of the matter never changed. So it's the people that shift and rotate around the subjects. And that's, to me, in writing Rachel, where I'm dealing with people who are approaching the same, the same topics from 300 years apart. And then you have somebody like Lilith who has seen every um, different opinion over this, uh, over the lifetime of humankind. To me, that's just fascinating. You know? Yeah. If you sat down and discussed religion with somebody from 1690, you would be amazed how at the, at the basic differences when you're talking to people before the dawn of the earth sciences in the 19th century, you know, things like that. So you have to take all that into account when you're writing these dialogues. Yeah, pre, pre-scientific discovery, religion was science and, you know, they were interchange, you know, inextricable that it was the world and there was nothing outside of it. Yeah, you know, it's uh, in that when you think about how, how deep that runs through the decisions that were made, and everything, you know, you, it's it's a pretty serious thing to reckon with. I mean, you mm-hmm. have to you have to consider that when you're figuring out how the code of people and their conduct back in the day. Yeah. To, aside from from Rachel itself, and kind of go to all your your works and your style, um, you know, you you are known for your female characters and how how they're drawn, and you, and you seem really at peace and and to have mastered that that balance of beauty and realism without crossing the line into cheesecake and is that something you're you've been conscious of at, over the years or is that just something that's always naturally evolved like how did you decide on your character looks your character models and where to kind of to keep it within reality and not take it to the next level to net to the next point well you know i don't know how much conscious decision there is to that because if I drew more cheesecake, I think I would sell more books. <laughs> so I've always regretted that, you know, I'm always thinking, why don't I do that? But I just can't bring myself to do it. I, because I can draw these, these women characters that then become very real to me, then I feel like they're, they're family or girlfriends or, uh, I don't know, I feel connected. And now I feel responsible not to embarrass them. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, even talking, you know, in these last 20 minutes of how you talk about your characters, they seem like very real people to you. They have to be. If you're, you know, you can analyze things as characters, but if you're, if you're creating, um, it will never have your writing will never have any spark of life uh, until you stop thinking of characters and start thinking of them as people. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee you that Linus and Lucy were very real to Charles Schultz, and Kachu is very real to me. So, uh, you know, that's how you do it. And that was really my uh, uh, epiphany um, to switch from uh, work that was very I don't know the work that had no life. The stuff I did in the '80s had no spark, and then I suddenly realized that uh, that they were people, and I began thinking about what they sounded like, what they smelled like, how they walked, and it just everything changed for me as a creator. So, and I'm sure actors do the same thing. You know, you get a role, and they're not thinking, "Okay, I'm going to plug in character two B three. I'm going to think about this guy and how they dress and talk and all that." You know. Well, it, it's very apparent. Like, I, I just got the uh, Strangers in Paradise on the bus, and I've been kind of rereading through it from the beginning. And you can see that evolution of how I think the characters, when they become real to you, the art style also gets more refined. I can, I can, I mean, maybe I'm projecting on, onto this, but I can see that there's like, there's this manifestation. And as you get more tied as the creator to, to the characters, they become more real on the page. I kind of did, yeah. yeah. 
that was there. And also the sillier they got, the more cartoony it became. And then it would uh -huh. go back and forth at, at, at will. I actually was consciously doing that because I was thinking about how different we look as, as people, whether we're being serious or whether we're being really silly at the moment. You can look at pictures of your family uh, over the years and say your relative may look so different in 30 different pictures, depending mm -hmm. on what year it was and what mood they were in and, you know, take a picture of somebody when they first wake up versus when they were, you know, on a date and that kind of thing. And I, as an artist, I love that variation, you know, actors love that variation. They want to have as many looks as they can on a character. I always thought it was a problem with uh, comic book artists who would master one look and then stick with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you flip through 200 pages and there's no variation. Um, on the one hand, that's good to generate iconography like Superman. But if you're going to write a book about reality, um, you know, it's, it's really good if your character wears different clothes every day. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that, you know. I mean, so I, you know, putting those things into your story um, helps with setting and sense of place. Can I ask to kind of go back to this too? I mean, maybe this is a a very personal question, but why why are you so drawn to female protagonists? Like, what is it about about these women that you've created that that you, that's manifested themselves for you? Why why have they come into the world as opposed to a male you know a male main character? I I have to think. I've, you know, I've been asked that a lot, obviously. I'm sure it's not. Yeah, I'm sure it's not a new question. But I always try to answer it as honestly as I can because I think I wish more people would share the view. I, I really, I write about women because I actually just think they're wonderful. I think um, men and women are really two different species. Women walk on this on a different planet than we do. They have a different life experience. And it's just to me, once I began to notice that, I began to see the courage and the different type of bravery and commitment and the goals were different. And, and looking at conversations and arguments and problems differently and some different solutions and all that, it just became fascinating. And it happened at the same time that I was becoming really disillusioned with mankind because, uh, you know, we're the ones that start the wars and build the guns and, you know, we're stalk we're the ones who do the stalking and all that kind of stuff like that. We're the violent ones. And um, so it kind of all happened over a 10 year period. Um, and I, I, I kind of switched from this guy who had always liked women to becoming more uh, yeah, actually something of a feminist. I, now, these days, you know, the older you get, the less strident you are about things like this. You you realize there's the world is too big for any one opinion. Uh, it's all too complicated for one stance and one point of view. So I, I really, my bottom line now is just simply I think there are enough stories about men and what men do. I think there are not enough stories about women and what women do. You'll notice, though, in my books that it's not like I want to live with women 24-7. Uh, you notice that oh, yeah, my, right. my women never sit around and talk about their families and the kids, and we don't go shopping, or we don't stand around and cook too much. You know, I'm not into that. I'm, I'm a guy writing about women, so I'm, I'm taking women and throwing them into the same action problems as Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. But I just find it interesting that if somebody had to do something really wild to fix the problem, well, instead of the muscle guy in the room ripping his shirt off and doing it, how about that girl over there on the couch do it? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's a lot more interesting to me. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that is one of the, the strong um, angles of your books is these these female characters that don't get highlighted enough and showing how they can be the same level of hero that we see in, with male characters, but doing it in a female way. And actually, the whole premise of SIP was that it was a tra traditional love triangle, but uh, I missed cast it on purpose <laughs> so you've got Kachu saying all the uh, James Dean lines and right uh, David the guy is actually the sweater girl and then <laughs> Francine, Francine is the, the the third wheel you know and trying to make it all work right yeah and you don't have to answer this if you're not comfortable with it but what what are you afraid of and has that evolved over the years hmm. um I think I'm most afraid of uh living and dying and nobody noticing uh that if i were to die um 
you know, within three years, it doesn't matter. You know, the day you die, that afternoon, there's still going to be a traffic jam and they're still going to, you know, play the TV shows and all that. That's kind of depressing. I always thought it was depressing that Mozart was dumped into a mass grave. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, there's always a, uh, there's a part of me that wants to leave something behind that I was here. You know, you, there are certain people throughout history that we know they lived because of what they left behind. And I think that's been part of the motivation for me to, to spend my whole life working to make as big a catalog of books as I can to leave behind. That's my legacy. Do you see that desire for legacy reflected in the choices that your characters make also? In the sense that they are going through small steps, um, small steps through a big issue, through big issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, the legacy that I hope remains is the themes that the books dealt with. If you look at the themes being dealt with in Rachel Rising, it's they're really, really. If you ignore all these extraordinary physical circumstances, it's really people discussing the the viewpoints of faith versus science versus maybe there's a third option that we're all ignoring because we're too entrenched in one camp or the other. Mm -hmm. One of my pet peeves is that uh, the human race tends to always pick two sides. Um, so it's always one extreme or the other and that as I've gotten older, I've gotten less patient with that. I think both camps are stupid and there needs to be a third option. Well, on a lighter note, what comics should more people be reading? Obviously your own, but <laughs> besides your own, what, what are you reading? Uh, what turns you on these days or what would you recommend to people if they said, Hey, what should I read? I would recommend you check out European uh, graphic novelists because they're fantastic and they, a lot of them come from uh, classical art training. So the art is gorgeous. Yeah, I was just talking at, um, at the Rose City Comic Con to um, Richard Starkeen and Tim Sale and they were, we were just talking, I mean, I started, the only thing I'm really uh, European mainstream that I'm very familiar with lately is Black Sad and we kind of, that's where we started talking from, but they obviously have a much, bigger uh, exposure to it. and they were just going on and on about all these european artists and how the european style is so different than the than the us you know the mainstream market style and and the creative process is so different too it is and it's uh, admirable um in the sense of their or their artistic approach to the work um they will spend a year making 80 pages and i have to make 80 pages every two months right. to, to survive <laughs> So it's a different approach, and you get a different kind of work. You'll get back, lush backgrounds and cityscapes, things like that. They take great pride in it, beautifully rendered. And so, yeah, I was in Europe once with Tim Sell um, for the weekend, and we had a great time going through the bookstores, and he was talking about Black Sad to me too. So <laughs> um, Maybe it's his personal crusade. Every time I pick up a pen, like a Micron pen to draw, I always think of the Europeans, you know, mm -hmm. because the, their line work and things like that. And then when I pick up a brush and start brushing stuff, I, I start thinking of, you know, Canadians and American um, new wave art styles, things like that. Yeah. But before SIP, I was really, I went through two years of just looking at Japanese stuff and finding a lot of favorites there. Um, but that's a very expensive vice because, like, for instance, one time I was reading a series called uh, Sanctuary by, um, oh, I forget. And um, the whole, the main story was about political intrigue. And then there was a subplot between a uh, Yakuza and a female police sergeant. And I was buying these books that were like $8 a piece just to find out what was going in this three-page subplot every book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I realized I had spent $80 reading this series and I still hadn't found out if they're going to get together or not. And I realized, okay, I can't afford this. <laughs> Yeah, some of those manga series, they'll go on for 20, 30 volumes at 15 to $20 a piece. Yeah, you know, and uh, but I learned a lot. Oh, Ikigami was the artist. I learned a lot from the artist and their, their work ethic and things like that. So, you know, it's been it's one of the things that's been uh, tricky to learn over the years is um, the dedication required to keep doing it. So looking at people who work very, very hard, like the Japanese or some of the Europeans who have dedicated their life to, uh, you know, how many pieces of art they can produce that they're proud of. You know, that's that's where I find my working inspiration, not from talking about DC or something. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, over the last year or so, I've been buying up and reading a lot of um, Tezuka's 
books, which have been, a lot of them are getting republished these days, and they just weren't accessible in the U.S. But you know, to to look at his work, like his breadth of work, and the amount of pages he produced over his lifetime is pretty unbelievable. And there there yeah. there are a lot of Japanese and European examples that way that are you don't find a ton of examples in the U.S. or you know or Canada that do anything like that. Besides, like Kirby is probably you know the U.S is equivalent to that. Well, one guy who's a cautionary tale to me is Matt Baker. Back in the early 50s, he was he was the Adam Hughes of the early 50s in comics. Mm-hmm. And But he worked himself to death. He was a wonderful talent, and uh, he was popular, and he, he took the work every He never said no. Poor guy worked himself to an early grave. So I try, I hope I don't end up like Matt, but um, I do want to have a long career where I can keep making books. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for taking the time with us today. Is there anything at the you know at the at the end here you want to share with us? Any last pearls of wisdom? Diamond codes for Rachel Rising? I I know you know we try to <laughs> with these interviews. I mean, we really do. We try to instill on people how important um, pre-orders are, especially to independent books, and how it really it really is sort of a life or death for a lot of these series. Man, you're not kidding. <laughs> In terms of like. Will I ever make another one for you? It really does totally depend on uh, book sales right now. Having Getting Comixology and getting digital sales has been a great addition to my income, but I'm still living off of the book sales, mm-hmm. and it's very important. And, um, you know, the world always wants to constantly turn away. And uh, so we're all uh, – that's what they were saying about Miley Cyrus. That's why she's doing what she's doing is – because she has to to get any attention in this day and age. <laughs> but I, I can't do that. Of course, I can't. I'm not going to ride naked on a comic, swinging comic book. But you could you could learn to twerk. There's still time. <laughs> uh, uh, so I have anyway, absolutely uh, no comment on this whatsoever. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go there with you. Aaron. <laughs> so. I'm telling you, if you want if you want exposure, you got to do what it takes. Uh, yeah, maybe well, not that. Some people do want exposure. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, recommending books to your friends and things like that and uh, those indie support deals and uh, blogging about them, it sure does help. It really helps keep the people, keeps them from forgetting. You know, a lot of people like something and forget about it. So thanks for the PR. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been obviously incredibly delightful to to chat with you, but your, your books bring a tremendous amount of joy to a lot of people. So keep maybe not so much with the twerking just go back to the drawing and the writing it <laughs> seems like everybody wins in that sense <laughs> okay I'll, I'll i'll i will thank you very much yeah and you guys ask serious questions <laughs> well, when we started the show we kind of we didn't want to do a review show and you know andrea and i talked already about this kind of stuff about books that we didn't really feel a lot of people got into we didn't want to say like here's a dozen books from the week did we like it or didn't we didn't you know like it and let's uh-huh. critique the particular you know inking style in this marvel book this week you know it just right. there's plenty of people doing that and there are some really good shows that do it really well and it's just not really my forte or desire and we just wanted to we wanted to take books that inspire us or at least give us food for thought and talk about yeah. them and I think that's that's kind of even more important than whether it was a good issue or not. It's is this a, a series that that makes you think? I mean, I have a degree in English literature, and you know, oh. Andrea has, has a you know theater I background. Have a pile of degrees. Yeah, you have a pile of degrees. <laughs> that makes sense because this was more like going on the actor studio. You know, <laughs> that is exactly what we talked about when we said, "Hey, maybe we should do some some creator interviews." It felt but, like that because we were talking about you know. Uh, more about you know how the motivation stuff and, and where it comes from as opposed to like you know what eraser do you use <laughs> right which honestly as an artist myself I'm interested in but that's not quite the same level of conversation that I think that mm. we're you know heading towards yeah I, I, that's why I like your show <laughs> thank, you. thank you I'm serious that means uh, that means so much oh, okay. it's it's a lot of fun to put together. We have you were just part of really good conversations. So thank you again. This was awesome. Well, <laughs> uh, so thank you, Terry, and and thank you everybody for listening to another episode of Comics Therapy. The show notes, including the links to some of the books that Terry mentioned, the episode archives, and details about submitting your nerd confessions and stories are on the website at comicstherapy.com. Till next week. RWC 
MG Rhymes with beef every time they speak the same time each week It's the group and on airwave domination The secret organization Who we be? Now? Radioactive weapons grade Burning up the airwaves like gamma rays Wouldn't like us no more angry about comics So allow us to pontificate what? Flying in the sky in the triskelion From the lantern core to the mutant rebellion For the megaphone people won't be telling them A new era's about to begin In comics podcasting broadcasting to the masses Long lasting Blasting into your face with the geek culture Cause you know that the love's everlasting RWG Rhymes with geek and it's time that we speak Same time each week from the infinite world So the 616 It's a podcast that's back in the mix with the RWG Rhymes with geek and it's time that we speak Same time each week From Krypton to upstate New York Rhymes with geek and it's time that we speak